Hi, welcome to Get Lit at the Walnut Creek Public Library. My name is Pete Crooks. I'm senior editor and senior writer at Diablo Magazine. And on Get Lit, we talk with local authors about their writing and their uh, creative process. Today we have Lucille Lang Day, author of Married at 14, and uh, just a really fascinating background that you have. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, I, uh, first of all, the, the, the book title Married at 14 just kind of jumps out and y you know you want to know more. This is a really fascinating memoir that, uh, that you've taken. Can you um, walk us through what the book is about? Yes. Um, before I got married at, at 14, I was a juvenile delinquent. I ran away from home at 13. I cut school, I drank, I smoked, I did all kinds of terrible things. Um, and then after I, became, after I got married at 14, I became a mother at 15. And the, um, the book tells the story of that marriage, and, and it tells the story of being a, a troubled teenager. Um, one of the things I wanted to do in the book was to upend stereotypes about juvenile delinquents and teen mothers, and I'm talking about stereotypes that say things like um, teen mothers have no future and juvenile delinquents become adult criminals. I don't think those things are true in general. They certainly weren't true for me. Um, and so it's better just to let go of those kinds of stereotypes. I also wanted to show something about how a juvenile delinquent thinks so in the first half of the book, I try to recapture what I was thinking and feeling um, between the ages of 12 and 19 and show how I gradually matured. And um, then I wanted to tell stories. So the book also includes, in the second half, stories about my adult life. There's so many interesting places to start this conversation. Uh, I want to get into the, the writing process, but um, when I think of juvenile delinquent stories or teen pregnant stories, I tend to think of those after school special TV shows that kind of wrap everything up with a, with a pretty bow and, and, and aren't necessarily a, a realistic mm -hmm. document. Um, so where were you living at 12 and 13 years old and, 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 and what led you to a, a life of juvenile delinquency? I was living in Piedmont, California, oh, wow. right here and uh, I was not living up in a mansion up in the hills. And when I say I'm from Piedmont, um, that's what people always visualize. Um, we lived in a, just in an ordinary house um, uh, at the bottom of the hills by Grand Avenue. Um, and my parents weren't wealthy. Um, the, and I wanted to get married at 14. I did not have to get married at, at 14. Um, and I, I wasn't pregnant when I got married at 14, although I admit that I had tried. Mm -hmm. um, but I wasn't. My parents let me get married. And I f started wanting to get married very much from the time I was 12 years old because my mother was emotionally abusive and I wanted to get away from her. She was given to uh, a lot of yelling, a lot of lying. Um, she also was physically abusive until I was 10 years old. So I really started thinking about, even earlier than that, about how, you know, how, can I, how can I get away and catapult myself into adulthood. Um, she hit me every day until I was 10, not enough to break bones or bruise me, but enough to just keep me feeling pretty horrible. Um, and then she didn't stop hitting me until I was 10, and I started hitting her back. But she kept on yelling and lying, and um, I felt as a kid like I just couldn't take it. And I will say that, you know, in saying all these bad things about my mother, um, she was not crazy. People, you know, I tell stories about her and people say, oh, your mother was crazy. She was not schizophrenic. Um, I, um, she didn't, she wasn't delusional. Um, and she had serious emotional issues of her own that were never dealt with. Her mother had died when she was seven years old. She'd been raised by abusive adoptive grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, she hadn't seen her father after she was 12 years old and she carried a lot of emotional baggage that had never been properly dealt with, and I think that's what made her the way she was. Did you have brothers and sisters? No. So you're an only child, and your mother had grown up in an abusive household. That's right. They, they, um, they, her, her, um, the, her mother's adoptive parents brought her, her and her twin sister from California to, to California from Massachusetts wouldn't let them correspond with their father after the, the mother's death. Um, 
use them as indentured servants. Uh, it just would only let them out of the house to go to school or to church or to do errands. And they did all of the housework and all of the cooking for the grandparents. And, um, and uh, I'm sure that the, the grandmother was physically abusive, and that's where my mother learned to be that way. And, in, and then in your childhood, I've, I've read um, stories about children growing up in an abusive home and when there's physical abuse, and, and that the tension of even when things are smooth, going smoothly that day, that there's always that tension about how long is this going to last and what's right. going to cause this to snap. That's right. And I did, while I was growing up, until I was 10, I would try to go and see if I could go a day without my mother hitting me, just by being as good as I could possibly be. But it, I, it, I couldn't do it. Now, this idea that you're 12 years old, 13 years old, and thinking, well, I want to get married, and that's going to take me out of this <laughs> world. Very I, I remember foolish. when I was 12 very years old, foolish. I was thinking, I want to see Poltergeist. <laughs> I wasn't thinking of, of I want to get married, and I want to 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 have that um, adult life start now. Uh -huh. um, what was it? What what were the images of, of marriage? What was it about that as the the escape or the safety the mechanism? That the escape. The uh, the vision was the movies. Mm -hmm. I'd seen r romantic movies like Sayonara and A Summer Place, um, South Pacific, and I felt that I was going to fall madly in love, and that this this wonderful romance was going to save me, and that I was, I was going to get away from my mother, I'd be an adult, I'd have a loving husband, I'd have a child of my own. I mean, now, um, I think young girls are more likely to, you know, to envision getting away from their parents by getting into college, by having a career. But, you know, and this was 1962, and the way I imagined doing it was, was by getting married. So you're, you're 13 years old, 1962, in the East Bay. We're just at the beginning of the big free speech mm -hmm. movement in Berkeley. That's right. But you're, um, you're, the, the culture of that time is for a young girl to get out into the real world is to marry into, into a relationship, and, and that's the avenue. It's not necessarily go to UC Berkeley and pursue your career. Um, so That's right. So at 13, you run away from home? I ran away from home. That's another, I tried that before, tried, uh, before getting married mm -hmm. when I was 13. Um, I had a boyfriend. It wasn't the same guy I married, but we, um, we took my father's car while he was working and we drove to Los Angeles. And um, we, you know, I, I had a vision that we would get jobs there and that we, we would live there and we would eventually get married. However, um, after a few days we ran out of money and there was really no hope for, you know, a 13-year-old girl and 14-year-old boy getting jobs. And so, um, so we came back home and were put into Juvenile Hall. Wow. Can you talk a bit about Juvenile Hall, circa 63, 64? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they kept me in solitary confinement while I was there, and it was very, very boring. And so I had a lot of time to think about my life and, um, and what I wanted to do next um, and, try to, and try to figure out, you know, what was going on in my family. And of course, you know, I didn't have all of the, I didn't have all of the pieces, and I was only 13 years old, and so you know, I couldn't come to very many good conclusions. Yeah. <laughs> and I did come to the conclusion that I wanted to have sex as soon as possible, and I wanted to get married as, as soon as possible. So at 13 years old, in, 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 during a, a stay in solitary confinement, you say, this is the game plan. Yeah. Become sexually active, get married. That's, so, that's right. So when you get out of juvenile hall, who is this, this fellow that you meet that you marry at 14 years old? Um, he was living with his, uh, his grandmother in Oakland. I actually met him here in Walnut Creek. Oh, wow. At Where did you meet Al him? It was, it was a place that's probably not here anymore called um, Al's Drive-In on North Main okay. Street. Uh, it was owned by the Quillacy family who'd moved to Walnut Creek from Oakland. And um, it had originally been the Doggy Diner on North Main okay. Street, um, but it, anyhow, it was a place where, where kids well, hung teenagers out. Teenagers hung out. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and uh, but the Quillacy teenagers um, were, were friends of mine, uh, Pearl and Carol and Eddie worked there. And 
So uh, it was, and I took a Greyhound bus out here on a Friday night. So a bus stop from yeah, Oakland yeah. through the Caldecott Tunnel, yeah. but, but even like our freeway system wasn't as evolved no, as it is now. Well, like it Piedmont and Walnut Creek were seemingly much further away, yes. especially to a 14-year-old yeah, kid that's, at that time. Yeah, that's, that's right, they, they, they were. But then um, the, the boy I ended up marrying, who, who was 17, um, came we, we, uh, through Al's drive-in with a friend of his. And I, and I had actually met the, these same two boys a couple of weeks before at Al's when they, when they came um, and they were in the back of a pickup truck. Mm -hmm. And this, per this particular night, which was a February in 1962, um, we spent a lot of time talking. They both let me wear their jackets because I was cold. And I struck up a relationship with, with Mark Day, and he actu actually became the person I married seven months later. This is right out of American Graffiti. This is <laughs> right. the time of American Graffiti right. and all night drive-in and the teenagers hanging out. So was and this was, were people were kids cruising? Kids were cruising. And, yeah. yeah, kids were cruising. It's and fascinating time. And, and, and how romantic did this relationship with Mark feel? Did this feel like were, were you more in in, um, in a rush to let's get past all the courtship and relationships so we can get married, or was there was this a romantic? Uh, <laughs> he experience? was he was resistant. Yeah. <laughs> he told me we were, he was a confirmed bachelor and was never getting married at 17 when, when the, the night that we met and uh -huh. I took that as a challenge I was very attracted to him and I started calling him on the phone after that and um, we, we struck up a phone friendship and I d he didn't ask me out right away um, and then I told him that I had left a lipstick in his jacket pocket a max factor pastel pink and he's and he is insisted it wasn't there I told him to search his car and uh, he maybe he lost it in his house I kept calling him every day and asking him about my lipstick and finally um, he uh, he asked to see me um, at my aunt and uncle's house the, the one evening and then he came over and when he when he came over to see me he handed me a box and uh, inside it was uh, the Max Factor pastel pink lipstick that he'd went out and bought for me, and he said, you win. Okay. And, and had you really lost a lipstick? No, or this I was hadn't. Just a I ruse just, to it was just a ruse. <laughs> it was an excuse to be calling him. Wow. And so, um, I, and then he still didn't ask me out, um, it, and it turned out that, uh, you know, uh, even at, thir at 14 years old, I had a, a reputation for... Uh, having boyfriends and breaking up with them and going in, you know, and going out with other guys, and so um, he didn't he he didn't want to get involved with me. But um, I asked him to go to church with me on Easter, and and he did. And then um, after that, we started dating, and it was very very romantic. And he would you know he would sweep me up into his arms when he came to see me and twirl me around, and we would declare our love for each other. And I felt like I was one of these women in one of these l love movies mm -hmm. that um, I had I had uh, I had been so enamored of as a kid. And uh, so, how do you? I mean, I don't even know it, today. It's, it's not even legal in California for a fourteen-year-old. No, to it get wasn't married. then what, either. So, <laughs> how, do, how does that work? How do you it get? It wasn't. But we we tried to get a marriage license first in California, and the judge said. I was told that you, by the clerk that I had to make a special request for the license um, because uh, um, I, I was under 16, and so I made we made an appointment to see the judge, and the judge said, there, you know, you're, it's illegal to get married at 14 in California unless there are other circumstances. Are there any? Um, and I knew he meant, are you pregnant? Mm -hmm. And I said, no, there are no other circumstances. I said, isn't it better to get? Um, married because you're in love and because you're pregnant, and he said yes, but um, it's also better to wait until you're older. And so he the, he wouldn't give us a marriage license. So we went to Nevada, and both of our mothers came, and they w and we got our marriage license in Reno. And our mothers lied about our ages. We were both underage. A girl was supposed to be 16 in Reno, and the boy was supposed to be 18, and I was 14, and he was 17. 
and my mother lied, I think, because I had, I had been threatening to run away again or get pregnant if my parents didn't let me get married. Okay. And I think his mother let him get married because we lived in Piedmont and they thought that this would be, uh, that they undoubtedly thought my parents had more money. He was marrying and, up. And he was marrying <laughs> up, exactly. So I was going to ask, like, I can understand if there was intense dysfunction in your home, how you might just want to get out of Dodge and get married, but what were Mark's parents thinking? Yeah, what they kind of relationship did they, they were, have? his parents were divorced. Um, his, he lived um, in Pleasant Hill. He had um, four stepbrothers and stepsisters, and he had um, also four biological brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a family of nine. Uh, he, um, his, his p mother and stepfather were both alcoholics, and they were given to physical violence. So he came from a very, fit, very dysfunctional family, and they, his. He, he was kicked out of the, that house when he was 15 years old because his stepfather was drunk and beating up his mother, and he beat up his stepfather, and then the, and after that the mother and stepfather said, you can't come here again. And so, so he went to live with his grandmother in Oakland. So both of you had been in, in <coughs> childhood homes that had all kinds of dysfunction and that That's constant right. tension. Um, That's right. Do you remember what the first movie you and Mark went to see together was? I don't remember what the first one was, but one that we went to early on was called Liana Jungle Goddess. Okay. And that was a German movie, and it had a, um, a, a, a woman you know, swinging through the vines, a long-haired woman swinging through the jungle. Uh, and I remember, I mean, we've spent most of the time at this movie making out, so I can't really tell you what the story was right. about. I think you probably did already. <laughs> but the, but, um, but we, I named my daughter Leanna. When we had our daughter was born the next year, I remembered and liked the name. After and, the Jungle Goddess. I named her Leanna after the Jungle Goddess. The reason I ask about movies, one, I'm a huge film geek, but also this, um, this silver screen fantasy that, that you were living out. How did the first year of marriage, what was the reality like of, of your, uh, of your Well, the reality was nothing, uh, was just really nothing like the romantic fantasy. Mm -hmm. First of all, he didn't, uh, he didn't get a job for a long time and he had a, um, a, he needed to have an emergency appendectomy. We had to move back in with my parents. Um, he, um, uh, somehow right after we got married, our relationship started changing. He, he started you know, really wanting to order me around, telling me I couldn't go to Casper's Hot Dogs anymore to see my friends on MacArthur Boulevard. And, you know, he was trying, you know, he wanted to be more strict than my parents had been, telling me that my place was in the home. Hmm. Um, he went out riding uh, it to the motorcycle hill climbs with his friends in the daytime, sometimes instead of looking for a job. And he t and I said, oh, well, I want to go out too. He said, your place is in the home. And so he was kind of a boy chauvinist. And um, it all came to a head when I was 16. And I had a, 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 you know, a not too serious argument with a friend of his. And uh, he and my husband, Mark, ended up slugging me in the, in the eye and knocking me out. Uh, during because you know because he didn't like the way I was acting with his friend mm -hmm. because I had hit his friend and uh, who was who, who could could have you know who was laughing about it actually um, so after he hit me um, I really uh, felt very negative about this relationship and I divorced him when I was 16 so married at 14 baby at 15 divorced at 16 and but then um, he, uh, he, apolo he apologized profusely. He said that he realized it was wrong to hit a woman. He promised me he would never do it again, and he asked me to marry him again. And so um, I, I did. And so I married him again when I was 17, but then, um, he, so although he never hit me again, I wanted to go back to school when I was 18, and then he didn't want me to get ahead of him. And he wasn't a high school graduate either. He was very threatened by that, and he tried to prevent me from going to school. He, he argued vehemently against it. 
and I, I just made the decision that I was going to go to school rather than stay in this marriage. And so, so I went to school, went to high school, went to college, went to graduate school. And you, you divorced for the second time? And right? I divorced him for the second time. How uh, old were you by the time of your second by, divorce? Uh, by the time I, at the time of my second divorce, although we hadn't been together since I was 18, I didn't divorce him until I was 21 because you know, I had married him, I divorced him, I'd married him again. I thought, well, if there's any chance we're going back together, I'm, I'm not going to um, divorce him. But mm -hmm. it was, but my, by the time I was a sophomore in college, um, I just, I knew we were never going back together. And so that's when I divorced him. So what did the girlfriends down at Casper's Hot Dogs have to say? Like, were there any other teenage brides in your in your clique? I mean, did what did your friends say about this this wild experience you were having as a teenager? Um, some of them, some of the girls thought that I was extraordinary, extraordinarily lucky. I was acting out ev everybody's fantasy of getting married to my boyfriend and uh, get, you know, and having a baby. Um, but then there was there was one uh, woman uh, named Diane who before before I got pregnant, came to see me at my apartment, and she kept trying to make me admit that I was pregnant when I wasn't, and said that um, uh, that she would babysit and blah blah blah. And I, you know, I said I'm I'm not pregnant. And then I was told later that she went into Casper's Hot Dogs after that visit and said, "Guess what, everybody? Lucy's eight months pregnant." So I guess you know you, you know that showed that she wasn't a real friend. Okay, so at 21 years old, you've been married twice, divorced twice, you have a six-year-old daughter, and, and that, that period of your teens where all your girlfriends were just going through high school and maybe going to college or maybe starting to be debutantes and get out into the married world, it, it seems like you've been through so much, and then you really focus on an ap academic life. I mean, you're... you're um, Biography has degrees in zoology, in writing, creative writing, mathematics, and science. Yes, uh, ma science and math education. My doctorate is in science and math education. So, can you talk about this direction that you found in in education and in academics? Um, you know, in your twenties and, and yes. All. Well, when I went back to high school, well, first of all, I'll say I always wanted to be a writer. I, uh, from the time I was a little kid, I didn't have any idea how to go about it, but it was something I wanted to do. And when I wanted to go back to when I decided to go back to school, I felt I would be a writer. But then, when I was in high school, I read Madame Curie's biography, and I thought, hey, that sounds really good. Um, you know, I, to spend your time making scientific d discoveries, I would like to do that too, and. I did, and I thought, well, maybe I could make more money as a scientist than as a writer, so I or a poet, and so I decided that I would be a, a writer and a scientist. And nobody told me they were both full-time jobs, uh -huh. <laughs> which I found out on my own the hard way. Um, but I just started pursuing both, and so I majored in science in college. Um, I'm, I majored in biological sciences as an undergraduate. Um, and, and then went to graduate school in zoology, and I kind of naively thought I was a born writer, and I didn't, uh, and I didn't really need to study writing, too. Um, but when I was, uh, after I graduated from college, when I was in graduate school in zoology, I started really seriously writing poetry and trying to publish it, and then I discovered that I needed to study writing, too, if I was going to be any good at it, and so then, um, I got um, an MA in English and MFA in creative writing at, at San Francisco State. And you started your own small press. You've published uh, anthologies of your own poetry. I wanted to ask about this memoir, Married at 14, which was published in 2012. That's correct. I'm writing something, uh, I'm, I'm writing a memoir type story about things that, events that happened two years ago. And I'm finding it's difficult to write um, in that moment of 2011, 2010, with the knowledge that I have, the hindsight that I've had. Uh -huh. that I what was your approach to writing about being a 12, 13, 14 year old girl, um, you know, many years later, and what was the service that you wanted to, um, to, to offer the reader in, from these experiences? 
Well, what I want, the, the big point I wanted to make was that, that juvenile delinquents and teen mothers are redeemable um, and to upend the stereotypes, like I, like I said earlier. But I also thought, think, I also thought it was important to show how a juvenile delinquent thinks, because I don't think they're wrong about everything. They see all kinds of things going on in the world. They see racism. They see sexism. They can see various kinds of abuse in their own family. And their response to this is anger and confusion, you know, and wanting to find out, you know, what they can do to make their own lives better. And so, and I think the anger and confusion are normal responses to some of the awful things that go on. And it's just that um, a troubled teenager, a juvenile delinquent, might, might make choices that are counterproductive rather than helpful in, in response to these things that they observe going on around them. And so I wanted to show that, and I, but I wanted to do everything by telling stories. I didn't want to write a didactic book. I wanted to write a literary memoir, so I didn't want to um, analyze everything that happened and sum up what I learned, but I wanted to tell the stories of my life, both the juvenile delinquent teen mother story and some of the stories from my adult life, and let whatever truths you know there are to share um, from my life, I wanted to let those truths emerge in the stories. Well, I'm sure there are all kinds of teenage girls who uh, could learn a lot from, from reading your book. Have you, have you received any feedback from readers who have had similar experiences? or who Well, uh, not specifically from teenagers, but it, there's, a, a, there's a very large relevance um, that doesn't have anything to do with teenage mothers in that lots of women still today get stuck in bad marriages, they, they get stuck in abusive relationships, they get stuck in situations where the, you know, the husband doesn't want them to work or go to school, the husband might be emotionally abusive or physically abusive, and, you know, and I, f I feel like as much as being a role model for, for teen mothers, I'm a role model for any woman in, a bu in an abusive relationship who wants to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, today, um, you know, it's like I said earlier, it's more a, a, a teenage girl who wants to get away from a dysfunctional family is more likely to, to want to get a, uh, have a career and finish school than to get married. But there's, I think that there's really a timelessness about it in the, in the dysfunctional relationships and the bad marriages because it's something that can happen to anybody at any age, at any time, sure. in, in any culture. Well, a fascinating story, and congratulations on the published memoir. It's has such an interesting full circle journey oh, to, to take from, from being a, a teen bride and, and mother to uh, a, a published author. Uh, thanks so much for your time. Absolutely fascinating interview with Lucille Lang Day. Uh, thank you for coming to Walnut Creek for the interview, and uh, thank you to the viewers for watching Get Lit, um, the program where we meet local authors, hear their stories, and share them here at the beautiful Walnut Creek Public Library. Thanks for watching.